Hey everyone and welcome to my presentation which is going to be all about my creative process for food photography. My name is Lauren, I'm the creator of Food Photography Academy and I'm a professional food photographer and educator. I've been working for myself for about over five years now which is kind of crazy. I work for clients all over the world um, helping them produce content for their website, social media, um, online things, magazines, all sorts. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you today about my creative process and how I approach a food photography shoot. We're going to cover quite a few different topics so I hope that you get a really useful overall picture of my process. So let's just jump right in. So when I begin a food photography shoot, number one step is your composition technique. So composition is kind of the backbone of food photography. Food photography is a form of still light art. So just like any other kind of photography, like landscape, portrait, um, anything, we can employ different artistic principles to help us with placement and arrangement. So way before I even get into the studio to start a shoot, I think about which composition technique I'm going to use and normally I'll make a quick sketch on a template to help me think about where my hero subject and any supporting subjects will go. Now I found over the years that doing this it really helps me avoid that blank canvas feeling where I walk into a shoot and I'm just faced with an empty frame, which can be kind of overwhelming. And I found that if you don't have a plan, if you don't explore different techniques intentionally, it's really easy to just fall into the same routines of the same layouts over and over again. And we, we find these sort of safe spots in our work, which even though they work, it can make our work overall a little bit boring. So having the ability to explore and choose composition techniques is the first step towards creating really interesting work. So let's have a look at some of my favorite composition techniques and the ones that I use the most often. So let's just go left to right. I'm sure that you recognize some of these, but I'm gonna give you a little walk through each of them anyway. So let's start off with the golden spiral. Almost certainly, I imagine that you have seen this technique before, whether it's just as it is like this, or whether you've seen it in a seashell or a sunflower. It's a pattern that we see in nature a lot of time. I'm not gonna to go too far into how this technique is put together in this presentation, but if you are a little bit of a maths geek like I am, then have a look into the Fibonacci sequence and that sequence of numbers is how this technique forms an infinite spiral, which is really fascinating. So the golden spiral is really great for soft, gentle images with curves and fabric and soft lines. I often pair it with warm, analogous color palettes and it leaves a great room for negative space. So this is a really, really nice one, particularly for things like flat lays or just scenes where you've got a lot going on and you want to follow a nice, gentle curve. Okay, the next one is the phi grid or also known as the golden ratio sometimes. It's a more of an angular technique which is great for positioning horizons and objects with strong lines like glasses, glass stems, chopsticks, anything like that. I really find with the phi grid it's just like a little step up from the rule of thirds. We've still got that main nine sections going on. But because the central two lines, both horizontally and vertically, are a little closer together, it can really help us achieve more of that off-center look, which just makes things a little bit more interesting than the rule of thirds. So that brings us nicely onto the rule of thirds, which is a really, really solid beginner technique, which is helpful for positioning subjects slightly off center for a more interesting look. So whenever you're using any of these techniques, it's important to remember that the strongest points in the frame are where the lines cross. So what we call the intersections. And those are the points that you really want to focus on placing your hero subjects and the key points of interest in your images. And then using the other lines around them to help you place supporting props and horizons. Now, when I say a horizon in food photography, 
What I mean is that if you're shooting a straight on or a 45 degree angle shot where you see some of the baseboard and some of the background, it's that line where they meet. We want to avoid putting that line directly in the centre of their frame. So both the rule of thirds and the phi grid are really good for helping us to position those horizons. Okay, let's move on to the golden triangle. So this is my personal favourite technique. It's probably the one that I end up using most often. It's a really great technique for adding lots of movement and dynamic tension to images. It doesn't have any straight horizontal or vertical lines, so everything is always moving on a diagonal, which is really, really nice for creating movement and interest. I find it particularly useful for helping me position things like utensils, so forks, spoons, knives, those sort of annoying little extras in a frame, which can just be very difficult to place in a way that looks natural. So I really find that this technique helps me to create that movement. And then on to the last technique in sort of my toolkit that I can use the most often is dynamic symmetry. Dynamic symmetry is a more advanced version of the golden triangle. If you look at it closely, you'll see that it's actually just two golden triangles back to back on top of each other with those um, intersectional lines extended all the way through to the other side. So this is a really great technique to use if you have a lot of lines to position. So if you're working on a really busy flat lay where you might have a lot of utensils or you've got a lot of angles and very angular subjects in your image, dynamic symmetry is a really, really great way to help you position these in different ways, but ways that still relate to each other. So that's an overview of my favorite composition techniques. So let's take a look at an example and we're going to look at an example with the golden triangle. So what I'll do is I'll begin by sketching out a really rough draft version of my image onto a template that I print, which gives me an idea of the angle and positioning. So this is by no means a da Vinci level drawing of my final photo. It's really more of a plan, mostly using shapes to help me decide where I want to put those main subjects. So here what you'll notice is that I've got the, the main cake sitting quite close to that front intersection, but I've got that drip down the side of the cake really following that main diagonal line, which gives a really nice flow through the image and a place for the eye to follow. I also used it to help me position the hazelnuts on top of the cake. So you'll see that um, if you look at the front cake as an example, there's one, the hazelnut on the right is following that main diagonal line down. And then the one on the left is actually parallel to the top left intersectional line, which again just adds a bit of context to the image and it really helps tie these things together using these techniques. I've got the three cakes themselves positioned along those lines, creating that nice sort of almost hinting towards an S-shaped curve down. So the things that I'll pay attention to when I'm planning my image is the camera angle. So am I doing a flat lay as a 90 degree image? Am I doing a straight on zero degree neutral image, a 45 degree like this one where I'm sort of semi facing down towards the subject? And to decide on my camera angle, I really first and foremost think about what is it that I'm shooting? Where is the most interesting part of this subject? If it is something like a pizza where clearly most of the action is on the top and there's not really an awful lot to see from the side, I'm not going to do a straight on shot because I'm going to miss all of the good stuff. So I will do a flat lay. But for something like these cakes where there's definitely interest on the top, but there's also a lot of interest on the side with those ganache strips, a 45 degree angle allows me to capture both of those things. The next thing that I will think about is the direction of my light. So I will often put an arrow on my um, sketch of where I want the light to come from. And I decide on this by thinking about the way the food behaves. So Again, in this cake example, you'll see that we've got these really shiny spots on the edge, which is catching the light. And we call those specular highlights, which are direct reflections of the light source itself. So depending on what you're shooting, you might find a side light works best or a backlight or like this, a more sort of diagonal backlight. 
Next, I'll think about any supporting props I might have. So this would be things like utensils, plates, extra little pinch pots, anything that makes sense in the scene and where I might place those. And also any garnishes. So like I mentioned, I use this technique to actually help me place the hazelnuts in a shape that I wanted. So I'll also be thinking about those kinds of things when I'm planning. Now, personally, I do like to shoot with my camera locked down on a tripod, but I'll often explore my subject and my scene freehand first. So I will have a little play around, explore my scene from different angles, find out what's working and then lock down on a tripod in that position once I've decided. So let's take a look at a few of my real life sketch examples. So you'll see that these are by no means a, a perfect drawing of my final image. It's just, it gives me a really good idea of where I'm placing things. So in this example, we have got the fire grid in the first top left curry example. And you'll see that I've really used that, the top line, the top horizontal line in the fire grid to place that horizon between the baseboard and the backboard. Um, in the second example, we've got the rule of thirds. So what I've done is really focused on those intersections to make sure that everything is pointing in a way that makes sense. But I've also got a bit of dynamic tension going along. Um, and then I've got a dynamic symmetry going on in the apple pie image where there's a lot more going on. So clearly then it's a much more difficult to arrange that many uh, subjects. So the dynamic symmetry grid really helps me do that. And then in the last in the last one, I've got a bit of a golden triangle going on, a little bit more dynamic symmetry, but this again, it just really helped me to place the diagonals. You'll also see that I've got quite a few notes going on on the image because I like to make notes about things like the garnishes that I'm gonna use, make sure I don't forget to bring anything through from the kitchen, the direction that the light is going to be, maybe even some notes about the backgrounds that I'm planning to use. So I really do walk into a shoot with much more of a vision and a starting point. These sketches don't in any way mean that I never change anything or that once I've sketched it, that's it. That's the final version. I absolutely will change my mind on set and try different things like you'll see in the top image. I actually ended up putting the chopsticks on the opposite side than I did in the sketch. So things like that do change. I'll change the backgrounds depending on what works, but it gives me a really solid starting point. And as a food photographer, I find that makes so much of a difference to me because things are kind of stressful enough on set when you're working with food, when you're under pressure with clients, and it helps me to have a starting point so I'm not going in blind. Okay, so step two, I will think about putting together my props and backgrounds using color theory and texture. So the first thing that I think about when doing this is what's the food? It might sound obvious, but this really is the best place to start. So think about what colors and textures are already present in the food you're going to be shooting. And then you can think about which kind of color complementary analogous is gonna go best with that food. So that's what I do when I look at color theory and we're gonna look at a couple of examples in just a second. So the color palette that you end up using is gonna have a huge impact on the final image. If you go for a cool color palette, your image is gonna have a much more fresh, clean, white feel. If you go for a warm color palette, your image is gonna have much more of a gentle, maybe sort of morning sun vibe. So it's something that is really worth spending time thinking about before you go in. And then lastly, is to think about the props that you're gonna use. So it's really important to only choose the props necessary to tell the story. You don't wanna overwhelm the food and take away the focus from your hero subject, but you wanna make sure that you're choosing appropriate colors and textures to create a cohesive image. So if you were, for example, shooting in a really modern, restaurant with a very clean vibe bringing in an old vintage wooden board isn't going to look the best in that image it's going to clash it's going to stick out and actually become a distraction whereas if you're shooting say for an old country farmhouse pub then if you bring in some really white shiny clean square plates it's probably not going to work either so 
Make sure that you're thinking about the overall feel you want to create in your image when you're choosing props. So let's have a look at some color theory. So let's start with analogous colors. So analogous colors are colors that sit next to each other on the color wheel. So for example, yellow, orange, and red, they all sit next to each other, so they're analogous. We've got green, blue, and sort of a navy, almost purpley color. Those colors blend together very seamlessly and very well. And they're a really nice starting point in food photography sometimes if you wanna create more minimal images or more of a calm feel, analogous color palettes can be really, really effective. The opposite to that is we have complementary colors. So these are colors that sit opposite each other on the color wheel. Complementary palettes are extremely effective if you really want to make something in your image pop. That may even be something as simple as a garnish. So for example, let's say we had a carrot soup which is sitting really in that orange red range if we then take something purple or blue so for example maybe a blue toned background or a purpley toned black background we can really really make that orange of that soup pop and that can be really striking in an image so it's always worth making sure that you're thinking about these different types of color theory principles so you can get the feel and look you want in your food images. So let's take a look at this example. So the predominant colors in this image are dyad colors. So dyad means they aren't directly next to each other. So they're not quite anal analogous, but they are closely related on the color wheel. So if I just go back one step, um, a dyad color, for example, would be sort of yellow and then this blue color or the green. So not directly next to each other, but very, very close. So we've got that going on here with the orange and the green. So in the background, I wanted to keep a warm color from the soup, the warm soup broth. So I chose this brown toned, lightly textured background in order to make sure that the feel was very calm, very inviting, very warm. And I went with black bowls in order to keep a dark and moody feel and provide some contrast from the soup itself. I thought that white bowls would have been a bit much in this image. And because I knew that I was gonna have eggs on top, I wanted those to really pop as like the brightest thing because I wanted them to be the main feature of this image. And I thought that white bowls might take away from that. So beyond that, I've used the golden triangle as a composition technique. So you can see that through the triad of bowls, also using the rule of odds, um, and also the positioning of the chopsticks to create some diagonals. So let's talk a little bit about lighting directions. So there are two lighting directions that are the most commonly used in food photography, and that is side light and backlight. Side light is the most common and the most forgiving lighting direction for food photography. The vast majority of food looks good when lit from the side. So it is a very safe option. And you'll notice if you flick through food magazines or cookbooks, probably at least 80% of the images that you see are gonna be side lit. The other most common di uh, direction used is backlight. So backlighting creates a really interesting ethereal feel in images, which is really great for creating specular highlights. So we talked a little bit about specular highlights earlier with the chocolate cake image. Those are direct reflections of your light source. So when you're working with things like drinks or anything shiny, you have the opportunity to pick up those little catch lights and those can really add a lot of dimension to an image. So let's have a look at this image where I like to think of building a story with light. So I personally shoot mostly with artificial light. I love the control it gives me to create different looks. And I also know that once I've set my lights, nothing on set is gonna change. The color temperature is not gonna change, the direction, the intensity. So I'm really working with a very controlled environment, which I like to be able to take my time with my images. So setting up light is about building a story. So in this image, 
I used a side light, but the side light alone wasn't telling the story I wanted to tell. You'll see in this little sort of uh, movie gif image that I've got, um, I'm sort of going through the different layers of light that I added. So all of these different images were taken with the same softbox and different modifiers. So if we have a look at the top image, you can see the final setup that I ended up with for this drink. So I've got my light, which was a strobe in a 120 centimeter softbox to the left, and then a black background at the back, which really helps to absorb any of that extra light. Then I added a flag for the background. So a flag is basically anything that is gonna obscure part of your light source. So you're flagging off part of it. And you'll notice in this GIF, um, if you see, there's one image, that one, where you can see a very, very clear horizon line. And then it becomes a bit blurred. And that was just adding that flag board. And it really helped pull the atmosphere down in this image and create a much softer feel. And then the next thing that I added was a negative fill. So that was just a black card that was sitting directly opposite my light source. Um, and what that what a fill card does is it helps to absorb extra light and stop it bouncing back into your scene so that the shadows on the opposite side of your light source are really, really deep and intense. So there's a lot that you can do just by playing around with fill cards, with reflectors, which would just be white cards. Um, even if you're just working with one light source, you can really tell a lot of story with your light. So let's have a look at a couple of side light examples. So side light creates a really soft, even lighting feel. It works for most types of food photography and camera angles. Something I like to do to make side light just a bit more interesting is to use a slight diagonal when I'm side lighting. So you'll see in the cupcake image on the right that the light source is towards the left. But if you look at the shadows coming from the cupcakes, they are pointed ever so slightly forward. So I haven't really got a complete 90 degree side look going on. I wanted to make sure that the little berries on top of the cupcakes had the opportunity to catch a bit of specular highlight because they were nice and shiny. So in order to do that, I wanted to bring in just sort of a hint of backlight. So I moved my light source back a little bit and angled it towards the front just slightly to pick up that catch light, but still give me the benefits of that really nice side light look. Is if we look at some backlight examples, these images have a completely different feel than the side light. It gives images almost a special ethereal feel and a lot of character. It is slightly trickier to master than side light because you need to think about whether you need to use some fill light or bounce light in the foreground so you don't lose any detail. Personally, I find that backlight works best on 45 degree angle shots and drinks. With drinks particularly, if we have a look at the image on the left, it really does help add that nice glow to your drinks. So you are really gonna get a very, very nice color and richness going on with drinks if you backlight them, as well as that really nice specular highlight on the top. So definitely consider trying some backlight for drinks. It's also a very nice way to avoid reflections on your glass because it's coming from behind. So any reflection that might be there is on the opposite side than the camera sees. So that's also a nice benefit of backlighting drinks. Okay, so the next part of the process that really, really helps me with my composition is tethering. So tethering is where you connect your camera to your laptop or computer using a tethering cable. So you'll see in this image, I've got a nice orange cable going all the way from my camera into my computer. And this gives me an on-screen live preview of my image so that I can really work at fine tuning any um, anything going on in my frame, I can see my compositions in a really detailed way and make changes much more easily than having to constantly be climbing up and trying to look at that camera screen because that tripod is probably at least 180 centimeters high. So it's far taller than I am and trying to get 
to look at the screen on the back of my camera without climbing on the table or risking damaging my set is very, very difficult and time consuming. So tethering saves me a lot of time and backache while I'm shooting. Like I mentioned earlier, food photography is a form of still life art. It's, you know, it's art, it doesn't move, it's still life. So taking time to set up my scene in a controlled environment is essential. And like I said, this is what tethering allows me to do. It allows me to freely move around my scene, style with precision without needing to constantly get back behind my camera and take test shots every single time I wanna change one tiny, tiny thing. The program I use to tether is Capture 120, which allows me to use an overlay while I'm tethering. And this is one of my favorite features of Capture One. So what I'm able to do is upload the PNG versions of my composition grids into Capture One. So I can match the technique that I use to plan my image and make sure I'm really, really positioning those things properly and utilizing the full potential of the composition technique. So let's have a look how this looks on the screen. So you'll see um, on the left of the screen in this little gray sidebar, I've got that little golden triangle preview and I've applied that to my image so I can really see the golden triangle on top while I'm shooting. So the feature in Capture One is called overlays and they're not only useful for composition techniques, if you're working with a client on an editorial or advertising piece like packaging or a poster or something with text, the graphic designer on the project may already be able to provide you with this layout to use while you shoot. So you can really, really make sure that when you're pulling the shot together, you are making sure that you're not going to be putting your key subject right underneath where a barcode is going to be or a title or something like that. And it really helps pull the shot together for the final use and create a great client experience. I can also share the screen you see right now directly with my clients via video conference. So even if they can't be on set with me while I'm shooting, they can work with me as if they are. And this just makes the process easier, quicker, just more pleasant for everyone. And it usually produces better results as well. So this is something that I really love to do while tethering as well. Welcome back to part two of this masterclass where we're gonna be going through a live shoot together tethering into Capture One. So I've got my scene set up here. I've got my big 120 centimeter softbox. My camera's on my tripod over here and I'm connected to Capture One through my live tethering table here. So I've already gone ahead and sort of set up the basics of the composition, tested my lighting. So I'm gonna walk you through my camera settings and we'll go from there. So I'm using flash to shoot today. So I wanna cut out all of the ambient light in the room. So like the light coming from this window, I don't want any of that coming into my shot. My flashes have a maximum sync speed of one two hundredth of a second. So I've gone ahead and set my shutter speed to one two hundredth, which is enough to cut out this light completely, meaning when my flash fires, that's the only light that's gonna be reaching my camera sensor. So I'm going for like a three quarter angle in this shot of these cupcakes. So I wanted to have quite a blurry depth of field, but not too much. So I did a bit of an experiment and you can see here on my, this is my sort of latest test shot. The F5 gives me a nice depth of field in the background without being too blurry. I've still got this nice main cupcake has got a nice amount of sharpness to it. So I'm gonna stick with F5. I kept my ISO at 100. I don't wanna um, decrease any quality at all. My white balance is set to flash because I'm using flash today and I'm shooting raw. So that's about it. So before I get in to do the finishing touches to the um, cupcakes themselves, I wanna talk you through the composition overlay and why this has been so helpful in Capture One during the shot. So as you can see, I've gone for the golden triangle in this orientation, and this has allowed me to really keep this main diagonal, diagonal line coming from this little bowl in the background, which is actually an oval shape. So I've got that pointing down towards the line, which is also pointing towards my main subject, which is sitting right on this front center intersection. So that allows my hero subject to be in that really prominent place in the frame. 
Then I've continued down this line to a secondary subject here. And then going back over here, I've got a couple more cupcakes on that line. So that gives me this main sort of structure and shape. I have added a couple of extra little cupcakes just to soften the scene a bit. We don't need to keep everything exactly in the grid and only in the grid, but you wanna make sure that those main structural components of your composition are sitting on the grid. So having that overlay has really allowed me to kind of set this up in a way that I like. But for now, I'm actually gonna turn it off because now I wanna look at the image a bit more holistically when I'm doing this decoration. So I'm gonna be using these white berries today. I've never found them in Switzerland before, so I was super excited to see them. I thought they would fit perfectly for this shot and for the tone of this background, which you can see is quite a peachy, pinky tone. So I wanna keep this sort of monochromatic feel going. So let's head back here. Um, I think I'm just gonna turn the overlay on just while I'm positioning the berries because I'm going to show you how I do that with composition techniques as well. So I've got my berries just here um, and actually I've got a little pair of scissors because the stalks actually kind of kind of tough to break with my fingers and I don't want the berries to go everywhere. So I'm going to cut them down to these sort of smaller pieces because I just want them to be like little accents on top of the cakes and then I might end up putting a few more in the frame as well. So Let's go ahead and have a look at the main one. So as you can see here, I've got this main diagonal line and I think I wanna put this in that direction. So somewhere around here, I'm just gonna gently lay that on the top. Just push it a little bit so it doesn't fall off. There we go, let me just take a test shot to see how that looks. Let's have a look at the preview. Yep, that looks nice. And because I've got the light position just ever so slightly diagonally backwards, it's also allowing those berries to pick up a nice little specular highlight, which if we zoom in here, you can see um, these specular highlights are actually direct reflections of the softbox. So that is really nice. Okay, so let's carry on with this. So I'm not gonna to go too crazy. Let's go on this one. See so now this one has got this nice diagonal line coming down the intersectional line. So I'm gonna try and follow that. Which way is it? That way, there we go. So I'm gonna plop that on the cake. Nice, and then let me get couple more. I think I'm not going to cover every single one in berries because it might be a little bit too much. Um, I think this one at the front, it would be really nice to just have a couple peeking through. And then maybe it's too many here. Let me pull them back a little bit. That's better. Um, and then let's do a couple more sort of just dotted around the scene just to soften that background a bit. I also want to make sure that it doesn't look too empty in between them, but also not too overdone. So let's try here. And as you can see, like while I'm doing this, I'm always watching my tethering screen. If I didn't have this set up, I'd be back and forth to my camera. Every single time I wanted to do something, I'd be check it, come back, check it, come back. Whereas having this live here, I can watch myself do it and kind of just tweak things ever so slightly as I'm doing them, which it definitely speeds up the process of shooting. Um, and it also generally gets me better results because I'm not a food stylist. So being able to have this extra sort of level of, you know, precision while I'm doing this really helps me. Okay, let's see, that's in the front. Maybe I want it to go behind, just to soften up by that bowl. Okay, let's take one more test shot and see how that's looking. Okay, I think it's getting there. This one at the front though, it's kind of bothering me and I think it's because it's, it's really competing with that intersectional line. So like I was mentioning, these composition guides, they're only a guide, but they really do help because that to me, like it looks weird 
and I think that could be why. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it around so that it's facing the opposite direction. So it's going to follow that line instead. Let me just come out a little bit. I don't want it in the scene too much. Okay. Let's pull it out even a bit more. And then maybe let's try doing one or two sort of loose ones next to it to see if that can soften that a little bit. Yeah, I think that is already already better. Let's take another test shot. Okay, let's have a look. Yeah, it's better. It's definitely better. I think I'm going to move this one at the front. A little bit more inwards. Let's try that. Yes, that to me is looking so much better already. Okay, so let's carry on. I think I'm going to do a couple of really, really tiny ones on the back cupcakes. So like, take a little group of three, little rule of odds group of three garnish. Um, I'm going to put that on this one. Let's open up our live view window again. And make sure that that stalk is down. There we go. All right, so let's see if we think anything is missing. I think that little bunch at the back is a little bit too much in sort of distracting me a bit from yeah let's move it back a little bit just so it's peeking peeking out but not distracting yes better Okay, so before I finish up and start going through my selects, I'm gonna walk you through checking your exposure, making sure that everything there is okay. Um, so once you're on your image, so not on the live view screen, but on your actual session library, I'm gonna come down to an image here and we're gonna choose the exposure warning. Now this is gonna show you any, any parts of your image which are blown out or have clipped shadows. So I can see here already that I've got a couple of little clipped shadows. And if we look on the histogram, you can sort of see where that red is kind of touching the side. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn down my flash power. Um, the alternatives you have when you're working with flash, your shutter speed is not gonna make a difference if you're doing what I'm doing, which is cutting out the ambient room light with the flash. So the three options that I have is to either reduce my flash power, increase my f-stop, so narrow my f-stop, make a higher f-stop number, or move my flash further away. Now I don't want to move it further away because that's going to change the length of my shadows and I've already set this up in a way that I like the look. I also don't want to change my aperture because that's going to change the depth of field in my image. So instead I'm going to go ahead and change my flash power. So right now I've got my flash transmitter sitting on the top of my um, camera. So I'm gonna reduce that to 1 8th, take another shot, and then I should be able to test on the new one. We can see that that, that exposure warning has gone down a little bit, so let's just take it down one more. Take another one. And there we go, and now it's gone. So now I'm happy that everything is nicely exposed. I haven't got any clipped highlights. I'm still gonna be able to brighten this image up in post-production, but I know that this file that I'm starting with has got all of the data included. So that's really important when you're editing and something that this exposure warning tool is really useful for.
So I think actually just having had a look at this image one more time, I want to move this cupcake a little bit more like that. So we can see more of the top of it and see more of the berries. So I've gone ahead and moved that. Let's take one more shot. There we go. So now we can turn off the overlay. Um, let's come down here, there we go, show. And we can see our final image. So once you're finished with your shoe and you've got all of your images on the side, you're gonna go through them and pick which ones you actually want to edit and which ones you wanna get rid of. And that's gonna make your post-processing workflow much, much quicker. And we do this all from directly within Capture One, which is amazing. So. Um, back in the session catalog that we've got going on here, you can see we've got all of the images down the side. So let's say some of these beginning ones, I don't want these anymore. So I'm gonna say move to session trash, and then maybe I'm gonna move this one to trash. Um, but later on, let's say these last couple of images where we were really happy with the exposure, maybe I want them in my selects folder. So I'm gonna move to select and then there we go, it tells me the file will be moved to a new location. And then let's also take this one. Yeah, let's take that one as well, move to selects folder. And then what you will see has happened if we open up our finder where Capture One created these four folders is now in my selects folder, I've got these two images that I chose to edit as selects and they've moved them out of the capture folder so they're not in this capture folder anymore. And then in my trash folder, I've also got any images that I moved into my trash. So if it does that for me automatically. I don't need to go through and move all the files around. I can sit in Capture One and say, delete, edit, delete, select, delete, select. Um, and then I can just go ahead and get rid of the entire folder of trash as soon as I'm ready. So I really love this workflow in Capture One. Okay, so we've talked a lot about techniques, about planning, about color and lighting and tethering, a lot of technical things that go into a shoot. But what happens if you're just going through a dry spell with creativity? Even with an established process like the one I've just walked you through, creativity doesn't always just manifest. I don't wake up every single day feeling inspired and creative. And there are a million things that can get in the way of creativity. So having a few tricks up your sleeve to overcome these dry spells can really help you get out of a rut quicker and help you get excited about your work again, which is really, really important. So one of the things that I really like to do is make sure that I'm regularly shooting personal projects. So it is very easy for us to get busy with client work and to just kind of always be shooting someone else's vision. So personal projects are a really great way to just have time to play around, explore new things, try different props, try different backgrounds, different lighting directions, maybe color combinations that you wouldn't usually gravitate towards. So an easy way to get started with that is to just shoot the food you're eating, play around with shooting breakfast, lunch and dinner, Take note of how the light changes in your spaces throughout the day, like maybe if you always shoot in the same place, spend a week going around your house at different times of day and seeing how the light behaves in different places. Do you get hard light through certain windows at times of the day? What direction is that light coming from? What kind of color temperature does it have? Those can be a really great way to explore spaces that you already have available to you. If you are also used to shooting on a tripod, then try exploring your scene freehand with different lenses to see what new perspectives you can explore that you don't normally try. That can be really great if you found yourself falling into this pattern of shooting in the same setups again and again and again. If you end up with the same three or four images out of most shoots that you do, exploring freehand for a while can just be a really nice way to break that up. If you're just gonna shoot the food that you're eating as well, it's a good time to work on your food styling skills as well. Being a food stylist is a different job to being a food photographer. Just because you are a food photographer does not mean you are a food stylist. But it is important as a food photographer to have at least a base level of food styling knowledge. So think about as you're plating up your dinner, 
how could you do this in a way that you would photograph it and just get into the habit of just trying to think about how this might come across on camera because if you're just going to shoot a few personal projects it can be a nice little extra layer to work on. The next thing I like to do is just find inspiration in the ordinary. Sometimes a great challenge for me is to just look in my cupboard at something I already have and just explore it as a subject. This macro shot of coffee beans was taken at the beginning of lockdown. After I realized one of the best parts of my day at that time was taking time to make a really nice coffee in the morning. I'd already found that having a bit more time at home and having the time to really try and make a coffee every day and work on my latte art, which is still very much a work in progress. It was, it was nice to bring that process into my food photography as well and to just see what simple things I could do. So I spent time arranging the beans, working on the lighting, trying out different intensities of flash and different color temperatures in my camera. And it was just a fun way to spark inspiration. I tried a few editing techniques that I hadn't used before and overall just came out with a really fun image. And like I mentioned at the beginning, I am the founder and creator of Food Photography Academy, which is an online creative membership specifically for food photographers. It's um, a platform that has all of my online courses in there. So there's in-depth courses on composition, Lightroom, editing, natural light, building a professional portfolio. We've got an exclusive community forum tech vault, masterclasses. It's it's a really cool place. It's brand new and I would love to see you in there if you're interested. So thank you so much for joining me in this presentation today. I really hope that going through my creative process has helped spark a little bit of inspiration in you and giving you some new ideas of things you can try in your own work. Thank you so much for having me at this summit and I hope you have a great time watching all of the other amazing presentations as well.